Tired of the everyday grind? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape. Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are alone on the deck of a stinking convict ship, becalmed in a yellow fog, while somewhere in the dark below you, free from the cells that held them, is a deadly band of murderers seeking out your life. Listen now as Escape brings you Weston Martyr's exciting story, A Sleeping Draft. That helps. But it's like I say. You can't forget. You can never forget. Yet it's at night that you think about it. With the water outside rushing past the hull. That's when you think. And it can never be the same. You can't trust anybody. Never. Not a soul. I can tell you, you just can't trust them. Not even yourself. What is it, mister? Uh, Mr. Finch says he's ready to board, sir. Oh, he is, eh? All right, well, I'm not stopping him. Uh, sir, hmm? he insists on bringing them aboard one at a time. What? Does he think I'm going to miss the tide? There's over 400 of them. It'll take hours. That's what I said, sir, but he... Mr. Finch, come aboard if you please. I'm sorry, sir. I should have resigned, oh, yeah, stinking. Yeah. Filthy, poor devil cargo. Duh. Everything I cockalorum, Captain? No, everything is not I cockalorum. What in blazes do you mean ordering my mate about? No offense intended, none taken, I hope. I want those scurvy wretches aboard now. All of them. You put them below and we'll weigh anchor. One at a time, sir. One at a time. We've got to search them. Why didn't you do that before you took them out of jail? <laughs> You'd be surprised what those swine can pick up between jail and the docks, Captain. We've got to search them one at a time, and that's a fact. They're murdering devils, every last one of them. Convicts came aboard one by one. I watched them. They were going from London to a land they'd never seen. A colony had bought them. Australia. 400. The sweepings and scrapings sorted out from the muck of the jails with Finch in charge of them. Oh, I've carried dirty cargoes. Dye wood, for instance, crawling with scorpions and spiders, not to mention snakes. Then there's cattle. But this... Weeks and months at sea with a human cargo who'd as soon cut your throat as spit. And what made it worse was I felt sorry for the poor beggars. I watched them come aboard until there were two left. Name? Wilkes. Search him. Hey, take your bleeding hands off of me. I ain't got nothing. Ain't you stole me last month? Shut your jaw! That's enough, Finch. I won't have the cat used on my ship. They'll get enough of it where they're going. You're a trusting soul, you are, Captain. Ha! Ah, how would you like that between your ribs? A touch of the cat's a lot better than letting this swine bring a knife aboard. Take him below! I don't know how they do it. Swelp me, I don't. You've got to watch them for knives. Next! Right. Ooh, here's a terror. Look at the size of him. Dangerous swine. Three murders in Australia. Escaped. He's in Brit when he gets back. Name? Abbey. Jonathan Abbey. 
Abby. Well, well, a gentleman in chains. I am sorry, Your Worship. Forgive us for daring to lay hands on Your Highness. I'm sure as how you've been wrongly accused. That's enough, Finch. Search him, then take him below. I want Mr. Jonathan Abbey shackled. He's a prize. We mustn't let anything happen to him. From the day we left London docks, I'd taken a violent dislike to Finch. He seemed to be happiest when he was laying about him with his cat on the convicts herded like sheep below decks. He kept them quiet enough. But one night I decided to have it out with him in my cabin. I made it strong, I can tell you, so that even he could understand what I meant. You all finished, Captain? All right, you hear me out. They're a bad lot. 400 of them all bound for Australia and they don't want to go. You follow me? There's that bloke, Abby. As soon as we touch Sydney, the game's up for him. They'll hang him, sure. That does not mean that you have the right to make life even worse for them here. Oh, no. If I don't, where do you think we'll be? What would you do if you were down there? I'll tell you. Get hold of this ship. That's what you're doing. It'll be easy. They're locked in and we've got a guard. Ah, you don't know them like I do. And there's another thing. When I searched them, there was one to five sovereigns stowed away on every man. Earned or stolen. That'll come to over a thousand pounds by my figures. They're entitled to that money. It's little enough to take to a wild country. It's true, but there's them down there what would slit the gullet of any man for a shilling. <laughs> you asked me to dainty with them. Ah. That's the way he talked to me. And I can tell you I didn't feel easy anymore. I did something I hadn't done for a long time. Brought two pistols out from ship's stores and kept them under my pillow. It was when we got around the horn that the first convict died from scurvy. We had to put him over the side, of course, and there was a lot of grousing. I went down to the hold with Finch. It was hot and stinking. Now you let me talk to him, Captain. I'll put it to rights. You tell him it couldn't be helped. Don't you mind. I'll tell him. Oi! Here comes old bloody pot. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> Finch. Did you steal the clothes off the poor beggar's back before you threw him in? <laughs> men! <laughs> men! We ain't men, dearie. We're dogs, or haven't you heard? <laughs> Why didn't you wait to bury poor old Smithy in the ground instead of chucking him in the sea? <laughs> yeah. All right! All right! All right! We've got another two or three weeks before we reach land. I'll make a bargain with you. <coughs> the next one that dies, now it's getting nice and hot. I'll leave him down here. And you can take care of him and mourn him until we get to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> How's that? <laughs> Half a crown, you don't keep him for three days. That's old bloody pot, always a nose for business. <laughs> <laughs> if you ain't satisfied with that, I'll see that hatch is closed down tight for the rest of the voyage. And you can boil for all of me. That seemed to settle it for a time. I began to see that in spite of Finch's hardness with them, the prisoners knew he was master and behaved themselves. That is, most of them did. But there were others. And that's what began the trouble. We were two days out of the Cook Islands when it happened. Yes? Captain, there's a man on deck. We brought him up from below. It's it's oh. horrible. It's... What happened? One of the convicts, sir. Oh, fight, eh? Yes, sir. Here we are, Captain. Mr. Darling ain't much of a surgeon, I must say. Oh, I did what I could. He must have been dead before we got him up here. He's... He's been cut to pieces. Not half, he ain't. How did it happen? Oh, I heard him shouting. When I went down the hole, there he was, propped up like against the bars. With his arms through, holding him up. Poor devil. Who, <laughs> him? Nah, he's dead. There's others in for it, though. What do you mean? How do you think he got cut up like that? Knives, Captain. Knives! But you searched them before they boarded. I did, and truth, I don't know how they done it. Small knives, Captain. Small knives. And we're getting close to Australia, that's what it is. 
Whoever's got them knives is after money. The thousand quid or more, what's on this cursed ship? I don't see... You're a trusting soul, you are, Captain. Maybe there's a dozen of them, maybe twenty with knives. Follow me? They'll run the others and rob them blind. Old sovereign, Captain, you didn't forget, did you? If anybody objects... (coughs) Cut him up in small pieces like this one. We've got to go down there and put a stop to it. (laughs) Yes, I don't think. How many guns you got aboard? Well, two pistols and four muskets. That's a fat lot of good. Well, must take the sweep with us, sir. We can try. There's no harm in that. Mark my words, Captain. Before we get to Sydney, all of us will probably have our throats cut. Come on. Finch and I, with two seamen, armed ourselves and went down into the hold and stood outside the bars. The men inside were quiet. Very quiet. They just looked at us, dark-like. You men! I'll talk to them. Now, you listen to me. We know some of you are carrying knives. And I want you to throw them out here. Nothing further will be said about it if you do as I say. Well? Oh, oh, Captain. My porridge wasn't hot enough this morning. And please, sir... Can I have sugar in it tomorrow? <laughs> that ain't the way to talk to this scum. The captain's a gentleman. I'm not. You know me, don't you? We know you all right. You, Abby. You listen to me. I'm giving you until morning to throw them knives out of here. Till morning. If every blasted one ain't out of your dirty hands, I'm going to have you flogged, every ruddy one of you. Fifty lashes. Do you hear that, Mr. Abbey? I'll think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Till morning. <laughs> then 50 lashes. You think about that, Mr. Abbey. Good morning, Captain dear. And Mr. Finch. You filthy scum, where's them knives? Where they do the most good. All right. I've given you a chance. I've played fair. Uh, no. Mr. Finch, sir, may I, uh, may I have a word with you? Oh, come back to your senses, have you? Now, bend close to the bars, because uh, what i got to say, i got to whisper. Well, what is it? What is it? Well, now, it goes like this here. <laughs> well, that's an hundred lashes, Wilkes. I'll take you first and handle the cat myself. Oh, no, sir. Uh, why not take him first? He won't feel it like I will. The crowd of men parted suddenly, and from out of them was pushed what had once been a man. It fell against the bars, and then, no longer with the support of living arms, it slid to the deck. We looked at him, Finch and me. His life had been worth a sovereign, maybe two. He hadn't either now, and the knives were still in the hole with them that had killed him. We will return to escape in just a moment, but first, many a baseball manager has felt the need of divine guidance to win the pennant. At least once, the story goes, it actually happened. Hear George Murphy, Janet Lee, and child star Donna Cochran in Angels in the Outfield on most of these same CBS radio stations. Enjoy this fabulous comedy at the Star's Address tomorrow night on the Lux Radio Theater. And now, back to Escape. As I sees it, we've got to have a council of war, in a manner of speaking. I'll tell you one thing, Mr. Finch. There'll be no flogging. I can see you're sharper, you are. Now, that's right. Too dangerous. We ain't armed for it. We're in a nasty mood. 
We've got to be crafty, same as them. I wish we could spill the old lot of them overboard. And lose your contract for carrying them? <laughs> Not bloody likely. Here, listen here. I'll get them knives. How? It's Abby behind this. He tells them what's what. Get him out and the others will come around. Mark my words. Are you going into the old? Not yet. Wouldn't go in there. Hey, after we cut off their water and food, feel the hatch, <laughs> you see what happens. They die. They'll die from knives then. Which do you want? They'll be begging you to take the ruddy knives in three days. And if they don't? We'll tell them to hand over Abby to us, that he's the one to blame for their misfortunes. They'll do it. All right. If that's the only way, I'll give the order. But not just yet, Captain. We'll let them sit down there and wonder. They wonder what we're going to do about them. Some of them may get nervous. We'll let them wonder a bit. <laughs> I didn't see Finch the rest of the day. The barometer had fallen suddenly, and with it came a storm. I can tell you I had me hands full for the next 24 hours. There was no time to worry about what was going on in the old of the ship, but I didn't think they'd have much stomach for knifing each other and killing. Next morning at breakfast, he didn't turn up at all. We searched the old ship, and then I went down into the hold. And that's where he was. And he hadn't died quickly. Someone had held him against the bars, and the others had... He hadn't died quickly. Present for you, Captain. Who did this? Who did it? I wouldn't waste sleep mourning him, Captain. He was a bully and no better than us, except that he was outside. Abby! Well, I thought you were shackled. Yes, I was, but Mr. Finch kindly supplied the key to unfasten me. You're going to pay for this. All of you. Where are those knives? In here, Captain. Want to come in and get him? <laughs> you, you'll pay for this. You're repeating yourself, Captain. Good morning. The blasted convict had dismissed me like I was a clerk in an office. There wasn't anything I could do about it. With Finch out of the way, they knew I was an easy mark. It was the nights that got on my nerves. I could hear things happening, lots of things. And it was awful. Those devils with the knives. And each morning we'd have to pull out six or a dozen, all cut about and bleeding. Most of them died. And those with the knives were getting money, money they sold from the victims. I began to be afraid of me crewmen, that one would take a bribe and let that murdering crowd out. I walked around with two pistols in my jacket all the time. And then, late one afternoon, something very bad happened. I was standing by the wheel. Captain! Captain! Here, Boson. He got out, sir. Got out? Who? Who? The big one, Abby. Two of us were standing guard. We heard a scream. It was Abby. Said he'd been stabbed. Benson opened the grill to get in, and Abby bashed him on the head and bolted. What about the others? I got the girl toes in time. They're safe enough. He must be somewhere on the ship, sir, unless he went overboard. Not that one. He's up to mischief. Here, take one of my pistols, mister. Aye, sir. And pass out the muskets. I want every inch of the ship searched. If he puts up a fight, shoot him. Do you hear me? Shoot him! The night comes quickly in southern parts. Did you ever try to search a ship at night with lanterns? It's not easy. There are too many shadows, too many sounds which could be rats, or a murderer who's bigger than what you are and could choke your life out in half a minute. We couldn't find him. But he was somewhere aboard, waiting his time. Because we were short-handed, what with the crew searching and all, I stood a watch. And I thought about that man whom Finch said had committed three murders in Australia. Don't turn around, <laughs> Captain. It's only a little knife, but don't move. What do you want? A talk? I've nothing to say to the likes of you, Abby. That may be, but I have an offer to make you. You know what I'm you know what I'm in for when we reach Sydney? Finch told me. I've no pity for you, Abby. I'm not asking for pity. I have an offer to make. The men below are planning to take the ship. I don't think they've got a chance, but they'll be killing. Those that have got the knives have got all the money, too. It's twelve hundred pounds. I'm aware of that, mister. I can get the knives for you. Huh? All I want is a chance to get away before the ship docks. How do I know it's not a trick? Turn around, Captain. Here. My knife. 
Will that convince you? You must have a pistol. You can shoot me if you want. What makes you think you can get the knives away from them, Abby? I can. That's all you need to know. I, uh, I couldn't help you openly, you know that. You're put aboard as a murderer, you're in my charge, and it's my job to turn you over to the police as soon as we arrive. Then... If you could get the knives, though, I might be able to give you a chance to clear out. That's all I want. The chance. All right. I must have a pistol. What? A pistol. You take me for a fool? No, it's the only way to get the knives. I give you this pistol, you shoot me down. Not likely. If I'd wanted to do that, Captain, I'd have cut your throat two minutes ago. You're a murderer. I know. You can't have it. Then it's either them or your ship and probably your life. Well? You talk like a gentleman, Mr. Abbey, but suppose you want my pistol so as you can free me. You just have to trust me, as I'd trust you to give me a chance to get away. Oh. Here, take it. What about the guards below? They'll shoot. I'll take you down. I'll say I caught you. How, uh, how do I get out again when I've got the knives? You send word that you want to see me. All right. Captain, I'm trusting you now. I want that chance to get away. We'll talk about it if you get the knives. Come on, I'll take you below now and you come back tomorrow. Keep your voice low, Captain. They think I'm tricking you into making a bargain. They think I stole the pistol. I told them I had to have the knives to make you believe that we wouldn't make trouble. I said we'd take over the ship tonight. What do you want me to do? Leave me the key to the grill. I'll slip out tonight and bring you the knives. Well, they'll want you to let them out, too. I won't. I'll lock it. How do I know you will? You don't. You will have to trust me, Captain. Did, did they know about this plan? All except for the fact that I'm going to lock them in once I'm out. Give me the knives now. No. They'd know something was wrong. I'd never get out alive. Give me the key. All right, Abby. Here. Tonight. I waited. And I can tell you I didn't like it. The wind came up a bit and I knew that before sunrise we'd be in Sydney. That is, if I could trust a murderer... At 10 o'clock that night, there was a rap on my cabin door. One of your crew nearly caught me coming down here. Well, I've kept my side of the bargain. The knives are all there. No, you needn't worry. Here's your pistol. You may need it. Thanks. Now, how do I get away? We'll be in port in about six hours, if the wind holds. You stay aft in the longboat. When you hear the anchor go, drop over the side and swim for it. I'll try to anchor as close to land as possible before I take her in. I can land without being seen. I've got some friends who'll hide me. I don't want to know about it. You just remember, when the anchor lets go, that's your signal. Thank you, Captain. I trust you and uh, I'd like to shake hands with you. I took the hand of the murderer and we shook hands like old friends. And then he was gone. Two hours later, the wind went down, and in its place came fog, thick, mucky fog. I had my hands full, what with danger from other ships and the blasted current that mucks you about off the harbor entrance. By three o'clock, the fog had shut in properly, and the blissed tide ran us all over the place. But proper dangerous, I can tell you. We were about 15 miles offshore, and I didn't like the look of things. There's shoals there about, and so I sent the mate forward to heave the lead. I got a proper start when I heard him sing out, By the deep fog. We got off course right enough, and at this rate, we'd shear the bottom clean off her. I saw it was high time to bring the ship up and wait until we could see something. Let go the anchor! Let go the anchor! Give her 30 
five fathoms to the water's edge, Boatswain. Aye, sir. None too soon, sir. She was shoaling fast. Blasted current must have been making five knots out to sea. Listen to her. She's holding, sir. The, the anchor. I forgot. The anchor. Abby! 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 I went to the longboat. It was empty. He's heard the signal as the anchor paid out. He couldn't see in the fog. And had gone overboard into a five-knot tide running straight out to sea, 15 miles from shore. He trusted me. And that's why I tell you, you shouldn't trust anybody. <sighs> Sometimes it's... Hours sleeping at night. When you hear the water outside and you think... That's when it's hard to sleep. Under the direction of Anthony Ellis, Escape has brought you a sleeping draft by Weston Martyr, adapted by S.A. Bolt, and starring Ben Wright. Featured in the cast were John Dodsworth, Richard Peel, Charlie Lung, Alec Harford, and Eric Snowden. The special music for Escape is composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Next week... You are traveling east on a cross-country bus while among your fellow passengers, seemingly innocent and friendly, are a man and a woman who plan to destroy you. You and 150 million of your countrymen. So listen next week when Escape brings you Anthony Ellis's exciting story, The Biggest Secret in the World. An auto race around the world. Impossible, you say? Well, it really happened in 1908. And tomorrow night, hear Van Johnson star in Around the World, the exciting suspense story of this unbelievable auto race. Van Johnson will be heard with the rest of Suspense's cast, direct from the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, where an annual automobile show is taking place. Suspense's production tomorrow night will be a part of the auto show. Don't miss it over most of these same CBS radio stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. America now rides to the tune of 25 million auto radios and listens most to the CBS radio network. <laughs>